everyone. Um, we are live once again. Um, I'm Abby. I'm here with Bill Shin. Bill is a principal security architect for AWS. Uh, Hi, Bill, thanks for coming. You bet. Thanks for having me over. Uh, well, this is a fun security party in the middle of the floor. Um, we've had some some really interesting some really interesting announcements today. Yeah. Um, tell me what you think. Tell me about Cloud HSM. Sure. So Cloud HSM, it's the next evolution of the service. Uh, customers have loved the, the service since it started. A uh, great way to have you know complete control over your encryption keys in a managed device that's FIPS validated and um, you know, it's a hardware security module that you can have clustered with your on-premises devices as well. Uh, so we evolved the product, next iteration, you know, uh, disruptively cheap, uh, fast to provision, great API, uh, integrated more you know, closely with some of the services like CloudTrail. Uh, yeah, customers really, you know, they just wanted it a different way. Uh, you know, auto automatically deals with the clustering and provisioning. Uh, you know, open open API, open client API, so uh, it's you know more accessible for developers to kind of get started and uh, use cryptography. So it seems like what's also important here is that you're you're taking something that developers already have to kind of do, and yeah. we're, we're making it a lot easier. Yeah, and, and, and encryption is great on AWS, right? It's a spectrum, so if you just want to have at-rest encryption, you can use the the native integrations with KMS and a bunch of different services like EBS and now EFS. We announced today as well, Redshift. Uh, you know, a bunch of services, S3, integrate deeply with KMS. But if you want to uh, develop an application that has field level encryption, for example, you can use KMS to do that, but if you want to have uh, a root of trust in a FIPS validated HSM device, you need to have a client library that can talk to that HSM and then uh, write code against it. So it's a great, great open client, uh, supports a bunch of different development frameworks and uh, is available for developers. And we have a, we have a brief question from, from Twitch. What is FIPS? FIPS is a Federal Information Processing Standards. It's the standard by the uh, federal government on what constitutes a, uh, they do validation of the hardware, ho hardware modules to make sure that it's tamper evident, uh, tamper resistant, cryptographically sound, that it's implementing the algorithms properly. Um, yeah. Um, so I know that we started off with that, that that the HSM and cloud HSM are, are things that developers are using. What's, yeah. what's a reason that I might, as a, as a company, be using something like HSM? Sure, so uh, several reasons. Uh, you want to have your root of trust uh, in hardware, right? So that there's no, uh, you know, no possibility of tampering with the keys or, um, uh, and you want to generate those keys with, with uh, proper random number generators um, and FIPS validated hardware allows you to do that. Uh, you as a developer might want to uh, get a key, have, the, have that key generated in an HSM, and then uh, encrypt a field in a database or a field in an application session. Um, all kinds of possibilities. We want to make encryption really easy for everybody. So. I, think, I, I think what I especially like about, about cloud HSM is that it's moving HSM towards feeling like a lot of the other AWS services where it's, yeah. it's managed and you can let AWS kind of do some of the work. Sure, so you know, customers have had HSM devices on premises for a very long time. If you're in banking or healthcare or someone has, you know, if you have a need to have strong cryptography with a good solid route of trust, uh, we want to make that easier, more accessible, a whole lot cheaper. And remember, an HSM device is just a key store and a key generation device. It's not a key management system. So you still need to manage you know, what's encrypted with what key. Uh, which is where you know KMS comes in, uh, yeah. So it's becoming you know a lot more accessible. Uh, same rich APIs you expect of AWS. Same scale, uh, same deep telemetry and, and deep visibility into what's happening with your keys. So. Well, it's it's kind of it's it's cool applying kind of the same principles that you traditionally think about for just like for for servers or something like Lambda, which is that there's or ECS that there's there's lots of work that goes into managing things and like why yeah. why have to do them yourself when exactly. you could. <laughs> yeah, not worry uh, about people it. really want to get out of the business of managing devices, and so just let us do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, plus, like scaling and stuff. Like when you think Absolutely. about it, and it's like if we can apply all that to, to servers or something, why can't we apply that to security too? Right. And, and these you know these hardware devices, um, you know, they're not they're not exactly. You have to rack them and stack them and mount them and everything else. So if we can provision that with an API, uh, it really really opens up the possibility that people might do more field level encryption uh, to make data safer and 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 uh, more secure. So I know that something is that's a that's a unique opportunity for people is that from from the from the customer side from the developer side they see that like okay well I want this so like maybe I want I want this feature and then from our side that they see like that something comes out uh, but we don't always talk too much about kind of the process that goes into it like can you tell us a little bit about how you guys yeah. like went about like building Cloud HSM like like why why you put in what you did yeah it's customer feedback right I mean everything in Amazon Web Services starts with the customer and works backward um, customers wanted. Uh, 
you know, Cloud HSM, uh, the previous iteration is, is level two fifth validation. This is level three validation, so it has a higher degree of assurance. Um, they wanted it to be, they wanted to deal with the clustering. So in the previous iteration, customers were responsible for setting up logging and, uh, and setting up clustering, and now we make that a much easier experience, a lot more user friendly, um, and a lot cheaper. Um, so it's, it's definitely like, it's definitely, you can see that the sure. feedback is that they're familiar with the Amazon services, and they're like, but I'm still using this HSM. Yeah. How can we apply those same things to my HSM too? Right, right, exactly. And uh, so we had a question in about uh, the physical security of the HSM. So uh, they are FIPS validated, uh, tamper resistant, tamper evident hardware modules. So uh, you get your own dedicated cryptographic module. Uh, those are protected by the same security assurances we provide for all of our environments. So from a data center perspective, from the way our operators access and manage the service, we have absolutely no access to those keys. Uh, so in Cloud HSM, you, know, you completely control the HSM as a customer, and uh, AWS doesn't have any access to the services. Uh, all of our services have appropriate access control. They go through robust security engineering. We have great logging monitoring for our staff and for the way we operate our data centers and our services. But Cloud HSM, if you have a contractual requirements or a legal requirement to have complete control and ownership over your keys, Cloud HSM is the right solution. Same security as before, just with some added cloud benefits on top. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Automation, uh, so really that's the name of the game these days, and uh, we're seeing a huge, huge shift in security organizations at large enterprises, really coming together with the development and engineering organizations. So, you know, we call it DevSecOps. Uh, it's really this integration between, uh, you know, all these companies are just cranking out code, right? Everybody's shipping code, committing code 10, 100 times a day with all these developers. Security needs to move just as fast. And if, you're, you're, if your devices and your security appliances and your, your security solutions aren't conducive to automation, you know, it makes it really difficult to integrate deeply with the engineering functions in the organization. So we want to we want to API, API enable security. We want to make you know, telemetry better, uh, better visibility through through automation programming, that kind of thing. So it's yeah. the it's the same, and it's, it's something that you can never really skimp on, right? Like secu security is always just because you're growing really fast doesn't mean that security shouldn't your security should. Right, absolutely. Come first. So security has to be the fastest thing in the organization, yeah. right? You have to keep up with the changing regulatory environment, uh, changing threat landscape, and the speed of your business. You have to be the fastest part of the company. Yeah. And um, yeah. It's so. a non-negotiable. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And we want to we just really focused on uh, making security faster. Uh, you know, as much, so many of the conversations we have today with customers about web application firewall and you know, security groups in VPC, Shield for DDoS mitigation, Inspector, all these great security services we've, we've, we've cranked out in the last few years, we're having just as many conversations with security organizations about the CodeStar platform and you know, code commit, code build, code pipeline. Security, you, know, you can treat everything like code now, right? You can check in your entire network trust boundary configuration, all your firewall rules, your yeah. monitoring, your network access control list, your routes. You can check all that in through a cloud formation template, you know, into, into a source code repository and build, build your security environment just like a developer would push code. Uh, so we're seeing that, that kind of coalescence of security and, and engineering. I love this shift in general towards treating things like infrastructure oh, and great. security as code with version control, check it in. Yeah, and, and test cases too, right? Developers yeah. have always written test harnesses for their code. And now you have things like config rules. And we announced today making it easier to test bucket policies in S3 access control lists and really determine uh, you know, what, who has access to S3 made that a lot easier with some config rules. But that's kind of the security equivalent of a test harness. So you, you want to yeah. make sure that your, you know, your VPC is configured consistently, that you know, uh, your IAM policies are configured consistently. And if you, if you have that going through config, AWS config, uh, you, know, you can have config rules on the other side to test and make sure that stays exactly the way you want it. I love too that like for, for a lot of people, security doesn't feel as accessible, like it feels hard. Mm. Um, and I, I love when we're doing things like adding, like adding config rules to check bucket policies or like enabling yeah. CloudTrail by default because yeah. it's one less thing, it's one less thing to worry about for they sure. can be safe without having to be a security. Yeah, expert. we've taken a lot of time with customers to understand why security is hard in those in traditional environments, yeah. and it's, it comes down to two things, you know, lack of visibility. And, uh, and, and low degrees of automation. And so when you come to AWS, you, know, you can be more secure in the cloud because those things are, are just there. You have, that, you have that telemetry and visibility. You know, today we announced that the CloudTrail console is there for everyone so you can see all your API yeah. activity. Uh, and then you know, everything's conducive to automation. So you look, take a product like Inspector, right? Uh, vulnerability assessment, try and do that at scale. You, know, you produce a report and give that to an engineering team you know, a month after you run the report, and what are they going to do with it, right? You have to be able to get it, the information and the feedback loop back to engineering right at the same time they're making those configurations. And so if you can take 
you know, a platform like, uh, or a service like Inspector, and take the findings and kick those into JIRA, or kick those into a ticketing system, yeah. or send a notification to Slack, or something like that. I mean, that's, that's kind of you know, really, really moving closer to the engineering organization. Sometimes I think that like, it's not even, it's not even the raw data in CloudTrail that's, that's cool, it's what you can do, Absolutely. it's what you can do with all the data. Yeah, we really spend a lot of time talking to customers about, you know, it's great to have CloudTrail, it's good to have it in the console, but you got to make it actionable. You know, you really need to take that, that data. We announced uh, long, quite a while ago now, the integration between CloudTrail and CloudWatch events, and you can, you can you know, very quickly get that, that immediate notification uh, from, from CloudTrail and send that to a Lambda function to do something, send yeah. it to an SNS topic, uh, you know, send it to a ticketing system and make it really actionable. Yeah, so, so I, I did DevOps before I came to Amazon and I yeah. remember like a couple, a couple jobs ago that if you thought that something was wrong, like you were basically going somewhere and looking through a couple terabytes of files being yeah. like, well, let's, let's play like, what could I find with Grip? That's like, right. what could I find with said? And now it's like, well, now let's shove all that data somewhere where you can do something. Yeah, you want to you have heuristics, you yeah. want to have visualization of that data. You know, I want to go back to something you said earlier about uh, you know, security traditionally being kind of hard. Um, you know, I think you know, in AWS, you know, we, we try to make it easier and easier, and yeah. as you move into more differentiated services like, like serverless architectures and things like that, you know, think of the surface area of a serverless architecture versus a, a, you know, something with an operating system and a serverless container and a whole bunch of code, you know, you're, moving, you're moving just like a Lambda function, an API gateway, you know, nothing's running when it's not, when it's not being called. Yeah. So from a security perspective, that's great. Also, you can focus on code quality, right? You focus on strong authorization, good crypto, good logging and code quality, and you don't have to focus on, as, on the same amount of security surface area. Uh, so I, I always say you know, security's work, but it's not, I don't think it's hard work. Right. I think it, and it's work that like I think the more that we do to make it feel like visible yeah. and like more like code than it does like a well someone's someone's in there and I don't really understand how the more the, the more visibility you have the more friendly kind of it feels yeah and like you said about serverless like the same with containers like why run a whole operating system inside a container if you don't have to exactly like make the attack vector as small as possible right and you have the portability you've got yeah. the ability to test more 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 quickly uh, yeah you know we really want. Uh, Really, want the security teams to be operating, you know, a lot like engineering. Yeah. So we're seeing that shift. I, I you can, and you can feel that shift in, in the announcements that, that we've been making lately. That right. It feels about like usability, accessibility. Like, how could I make this just like a little bit happier for people? Right. If you look at all the improvements to identity access management over the last couple of years, right? Uh, uh, policy simulator, access advisor. Uh, you know, all the ways to like to model what your policies are are really doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, this becomes so much easier and, and uh, more accessible. Yeah, yeah, and you think about something like an like an IAM policy or a bucket policy, like yeah. being able to see like, well, not is it just like this, like not not just here's the policy, but like here's what this policy is doing. Absolutely, uh, Access Advisor is one of the greatest parts of IAM. Really, it really tells yeah. you, you know, it's not it's a really hard problem to figure out. Okay, I can look at a policy and see if someone has entitlements, but it's really difficult to tell if someone's using those entitlements. So yeah. Access Advisor does that for you. Um, you know, we, we were talking about developer enablement and. And one of the things, you know, people are really, um, and organizations, it is, uh, you know, it's a challenge to find security talent, right? And so the more we can make that simple, but the more that organizations are able to put, you know, security functionality and, and some of the responsibility into the engineering teams and make it easy for engineers and developers to build something that's secure, it yeah. gives more scale and more, more time back to the security teams who need to, you know, focus on threat modeling and focus yeah. on, you know, vulnerability assessment and threat intelligence and those kind of things. And, and let the developers, you know, take responsibility for some of that security and give them the tools they need and set up the patterns they want. Uh, and they can, you know, they can, they can do it just, just as good of a job at securing their workloads as, you know, as yeah. deeply working with the You empower security. them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it only helps and then everyone. And then they have deep ownership over security yeah. too, right? Yeah. You saw so. the same kind of shift, I think, with, with, with ops in general. That yeah. it used to be like a, well, I do dev, and then you do ops, and then he does security, and then she does she does this. But like, w what I really like is a shift towards like a, ops and security are everyone. Like, and if you write your right. applications to be kind of secure by default, to scale by yeah. default, then like, yeah, everybody's winning. It's everybody's responsibility too. Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't, you know, you, you, if you're writing software today, you have to think about security. Yeah. You got to think about authorization, detective controls, uh, you know, monitoring, cryptography. I mean, most developers today, I think, do take it pretty seriously. Yeah. And it really matters. It really, really, really makes a difference when uh, when the developers themselves are, are doing the threat modeling for their applications, and then security can advise and consult. Yeah. yeah. And then you you make so much more progress too, and everyone's invested and everyone's working on it. Like yeah. many minds are better than just one mind. So That's like, right. when we all work together, we can we can yeah. make a lot more progress. Absolutely. Um, my final question uh, from the audience on, on Cloud HSM, uh, which we get for every new service, mm -hmm. can we use CloudFormation? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'll have to follow up. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me. You um, thank it you. was a pleasure. If anyone has any questions, uh, we will be back live streaming on Twitch. Um, we'll be talking with a couple more service owners, um, and then we will be recapping at the end of the day. Um, so feel free to tweet or, or chat us your questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Good time. Thanks a lot.